So we'll, we'll make a start. Th thank you everyone for, for joining uh, day two of the Advances of a Field Experiment Conference. Um, today we have uh, also a, a, a tight packed schedule um, that you'll hold, be, hopefully you'll be a part of. Uh, this morning or um, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world, we'll have uh, Larry Katz giving uh, the second keynote of the conference and John will do the introduction for Larry. We'll then have a 20 minute break and then we'll have our la sort of last panel um, of the conference on gender and field experiments with Eugene Easy, Corinne Lowe, and August Stellard. We'll have a lunch break, a quick lunch break, and then we'll have the, the final keynote of the day with Ricky Mamandier, where um, we'll have some closer remarks after that. Uh, in terms of just the usual um, housekeeping rules, please do ask as many questions as you want in, in the Q&A. John and I will try to get through uh, each of those questions. Uh, and Larry will be happy to, to hopefully answer them all as well. So uh, thank you everyone for rejoining this morning. I'll turn it over to John. Hey, super, thanks Rob. Um, good day, good night, good evening everyone uh, around the world. We, we have just a wonderful schedule for today. And I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Larry Katz as this session's plenary speaker. Now, I was introduced to Larry nearly 30 years ago through his 1992 QJE study with my colleague Kevin Murphy that documented and explained the sharp rise in inequality in the US labor market after the mid-1970s. Now, when I first picked up the paper, I thought, I read the intro and I thought there's no way that these guys would be able to solve this problem. It feels intractable to me. You, there's no way you can disentangle the demand and supply sides in a useful way to learn something that these two colleagues say they're going to learn about. But lo and behold, the methods used in that paper to isolate and evaluate the contributions of each of the sides were quite innovative back then and remain quite useful today. So that, that's a real paper that has stood the test of time. Now, Larry's broader research agenda in exploring the central determinants of earnings and earnings inequality has continued ever since. Larry's produced deep insight after deep insight. Now, for those interested in this line of work, I urge you to download, read his book titled The Race Between Education and Technology. This is a book that Larry wrote with his research and life partner, Claudia Golden. And I agree with our colleagues, Darone Simuglu and David Otter, when they summarize a book noting, quote, a monumental achievement that supplies a unified framework for interpreting how the demand and supply of human capital have shaped the distribution of earnings in the US labor market in the 20th century. It's that and all, and even more of that. Now, of course, what usually follows great science are wonderful awards, and Larry has uh, a mitt full of awards, including he's a fellow of the Econometric Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Larry was elected a member of the US National Academy of Sciences in 2014. There are many, many more awards that are too numerous to summarize here. Yet I should note that I'm of the mind and strong belief that an even bigger award will come in the future. And let's keep our fingers crossed about that one. Now, usually at this point, I stop and I turn it over to the speaker. But in this particular case, the description would be incomplete. And that's because beyond the remarkable scientific achievements of Larry, He's also served the economics profession with great willingness for decades. Now, for all of you who were yesterday in the journal editor session, you might recall that I began with an introduction about how editors serve a very important gatekeeper role for our profession. Uh, Larry disagreed with me, and, and he noted that they also serve to improve papers. Of course, I agree with that. Um, my statement actually pertained to the modal editor, not uh, the editor Larry Katz. Now, when you think about the editor Larry Katz, for nearly the last 30 years, Larry has been an editor at the QJE, rising 
of course, uh, the journal has really risen in prominence. And I can actually be quite confident, and I know from my own personal experience, that Larry has invested uh, an enormous amount of time and effort to make my own papers better, as well as many other people's papers better. Now, in my mind, Larry, in that regard, stands out with only Orly Ashenfelter. In my 25 years, the two of them have really served to be sort of the pinnacle of all editors who I've dealt with. There are many other great editors, but Larry and Orly have really stood out. And when they uh, appraise manuscripts, especially the work of juniors, there, there's always uh, very nice remarks, but also very good remarks to make the work better. So all of that is to say that if your work doesn't end up in the JPE, then I think using the QJE as a good fallback would be, <laughs> would, would be a good strategy. No, but uh, today Larry will discuss his wonderful field experimental work in the area of what we older economists have, have grown up on calling regional and urban economics. His work in this area has shown really interesting and novel insights on the effects of neighborhoods, not only on the adults who move into the neighborhood, but also the children's future outcomes. So Larry, I want to thank you very much for everything you've done for not only my career, for the profession, but also for the science. Thank you so much and welcome, Larry. Well, thank you very much for that overly kind uh, introduction. Let me just make sure I can share the screen. And oh, let me just, okay. Go here. Okay, hopefully this can be seen. And what I'd like to do today, as John does, you know, I mainly work in labor economics for many years and understanding the wave structure and inequality, but it's also a major passion of mine and interest has been understanding um, segregation and sorting of individuals and families across neighborhoods. Um, and trying to understand um, how, you know, what are the causes of changes in segregation by economic and status and racial segregation? What are the consequences? And to what extent um, are there causal effects of neighborhood environments on outcomes? And this has led me um, to have the opportunities to do some uh, field experiments going way back um, in the days when it was much more difficult. And I wanna use my talk today to talk about some of this um, work, both um, for the substance of what we've learned about neighborhood effects and also um, for the journey of trying to combine, you know, observational evidence and field evidence in highly controversial and difficult topics. And in my background today, um, I have a large mountain, uh, Denali, and a winding path. And there is a reason for it, not just to block out my boring bookshelf, but I feel like this has actually been a 40-year research journey along a winding path and then having to scale a very large mountain. And hopefully, uh, now that we have done that, um, one doesn't have to take that circuitous route um, to do research on these sorts of issues. So, okay. The, the motivation um, for this work is really a huge issue in the social sciences, which is in any observational data set, you see tremendous differences across neighborhoods in any metropolitan area you know, around the world in both the economic outcomes of adults in those neighborhoods contemporaneously and in the long run outcomes for children. Um, something that sociologists such as William Julius Wilson have sort of documented and many economists with the modern version of this being the work um, of my former student Raj Chetty with my colleague Nathan Hendren um, and a series of papers that have led to amazing maps of this type using detailed um, linked census and tax data for the United States showing the difference for families in the bottom half of the income distribution in adult earnings for kids who grow up here in different commuting zones in the US, you know, the huge variation and showing in the recent Opportunity Atlas that even at the level of blocks 
Um, this is in Los Angeles. The differences in the colors showing the red ones having about half the um, income and the question, you know, uh, as adults of those in the blue ones. Um, and the question we want to ask is how much of these huge disparities about where you grew up um, are sort of causal um, versus the sorting um, of, you know, the fact that, you know, where you can afford to live clearly depends on your parents' economic um, uh, opportunities. And these issues are, have become more and more urgent. Um, segregation by income across areas with higher and lower upward mobility has increased dramatically um, in the last 40 to 50 years um, in the United States and racial and ethnic segregation of where people live is huge in the US and much of the world. And while there's been small improvements, it's not changed much in the last 40 or 50 years. And as I noted, children who grow up in more disadvantaged neighborhoods fare much worse on a wide range of outcomes. And adults in poor neighborhoods, some of the oldest evidence in the social sciences, you know, um, have you know, different, very, very varied you know, worse economic and health outcomes. And, you know, d does your zip code, you know, is it destiny? You know, there's a huge alternative explanation that this is largely selection. You know, people uh, with better economic opportunities sort into, you know, areas with nicer housing and better amenities, and that we could see all these patterns without any causal effects. But then there are, you know, very, you know, large theories, you know, of, you know, peers mattering, school resources, environmental factors that have developmental long run effects, your exposure in childhood to different neighborhoods potentially mattering a lot, um, as well as the current opportunities for crime or employment, contemporaneous mattering for say adolescents or adults. And the research I'm gonna talk about is really an attempt of using a large scale field experiment um, and then comparing it to observational to try to test how much, if we could truly randomly assign the likelihood of low income families living in different types of neighborhoods, would it matter um, for their outcomes? Um, and I was presented with the opportunity to make progress of this in the early to mid 1990s um, with a large scale field experiment that I helped design when I was working as the chief economist for the US Department of Labor um, in the first Clinton administration in 93 um, and 94, um, working with the team as HUD and then later back as an academic, got an opportunity to be involved in evaluating the moving to opportunity experiment. And this is, since this is a keynote address, um, a little bit of, you know, uh, probably boring and, you know, intellectual history. Um, while I've largely worked on labor markets over much of my career, I've always, my mother was a school psychologist. She worked in, you know, low income schools during the sort of Watts riots in Los Angeles. I was one, in one of the early integrative voluntary integration programs in Los Angeles when I was growing up um, to try to reduce racial um, segregation of schools. And as an undergraduate at Berkeley, where I had great opportunities, I did my earliest research actually on the growth of land use um, restrictive regulations and how that affected housing prices and segregation. I actually gave a commencement address way back in 1981. So this really is a 40 year journey. And some of my early work with Ann Case was doing surveys in Boston across different neighborhoods, trying to observationally estimate neighborhood effects, but worrying a ton about the causal inference issues um, of sorting. And um, a huge, unfortunate, terrible event um, created a research opportunity to actually do a field experiment in this area. That event was the um, Rodney King Los Angeles riots um, uh, of 1992 following you know, controversial early you know, video that we've just seen so repeatedly since then um, uh, of racial police uh, difficulties and the responses to when um, all the officers were acquitted um, in Los Angeles for a brief moment in late 1992, the US Congress passed an urban and housing bill and included um, some uh, small amount of money for evaluations of innovative approaches to trying to help um, create opportunity 
for people in high poverty er urban areas. And in you know, early 93, a group of us in the Clinton administration and an interagency team um, looking at sort of problems in urban um, and high poverty areas and rurals um, tried to make sure this money got used for a randomized experiment that became um, the moving to opportunity experiment, um, which went into the field from 1994 to 1998 and literally um, operated in five cities in the US, Boston, New York, LA, Chicago, and Baltimore. Eligible families lived in the highest poverty public housing projects um, where lots of people were interested in trying to move um, to less segregated, um, higher opportunity areas, but the types of vouchers in the US, which is the program for that uh, type of moves were highly rationed, waiting list of eight to 10 years. So we got some extra vouchers and tried to provide some help, to fam help for families living in these areas to move to lower poverty areas. So the MTO design that we came up with was a control group that continued living, have, getting their public housing support, and two different treatment groups. One was one to really test if you tr truly change neighborhood environments, would it matter? And this was um, the experimental or low poverty voucher one where you got a voucher, but you could only use it to move to a low poverty area. And we provided um, mobility counseling um, with local nonprofits to the families. One, which was a test of the ongoing program, what's the difference um, of getting a Section 8, the, the regular voucher. So this is the big program in the US for low-income housing that provides um, subsidized support um, for moving into private um, sort of housing, but you have only a limited time period to lease up. And leasing up in many of these urban areas was quite difficult. And, um, you know, so uh, we, Ideally, would have liked to have had a, a version of the experimental voucher where we didn't force you to use the voucher to move to a low poverty area to give choice. And then later work, I've done um, this sort of stuff. But this was our goal, given the power considerations of five sites. And as I noted, about 4,600 families were randomly assigned, about 1,000 per each site, um, into these three different groups, um, and about 10,000 kids um, who we've been following um, over time. And the first question you want to ask, was there actually an experiment in, you know, did people actually, were people actually to move with these vouchers and change the neighborhoods? And the answer is yes, about half the experimental voucher group was able to lease up in the four to six month period they had available and moved to low poverty areas initially. They had to stay there for a year and then they were able to move wherever they could with a voucher and about 60% of the Section 8 or regular voucher group moved. Um, so there really was an experiment. And um, what I want to show you here is over the next 18 years, this is sort of an average of the neighborhoods, the different um, treatment groups lived in, the sort of compliers who moved with experimental over the next 15 to 20 years, lived in areas with about you know 20% poverty rates, not the 10% they started out because some moved again, but mainly because areas with low poverty in 1990 that you could use a Section 8 voucher to move to got slightly worse over time, but hugely different than the control group that are living on average in 50% poverty areas. So think of this of moving from the sort of bottom 5% of sort of areas in upward mobility or in terms of family income to something like the 30th to 40th percentile um, neighborhood in most of these metropolitan areas over the next 15 years. That's the nature of the experiment. And the Section 8 group is somewhere in between, still in high poverty areas, but not nearly as bad. Um, and this has been a very long effort, and I need to thank a ton of amazing um, collaborators who have been involved in this work. Um, I particularly want to point out um, Jeff Kling um, and Jens Ludwig, who have been involved for many years and were our co-PIs in the early work. Jeff starting as a graduate student who got me pulled back into evaluating this and Jens as our research director um, for many years. Um, and more recently, Raj Chetty 
and Nathan Hendren, but we've had a very multidisciplinary research team. We worked with a linguist, uh, John Rickford at Stanford, with um, medical uh, sociologists such as Ron Kessler, and more recently um, with a set of uh, people like Stephanie DeLuca and our more recent work who are um, ethnographers. So it's been a very multidisciplinary research effort. And I won't go through um, all the different ones, but it's been a long journey um, with papers, you know, doing the short run analysis where we only were able to do Boston, um, inter, you know, qualitative work, interim analyses where we were basically able to do all five sites, um, longer run analysis and very long run. Um, and we've moved into trying to see how do we help families, you know, what are the role of the counselors and others in moving and the creating the moves to opportunity project that we've recently been undertaking um, in Seattle and King County. So there is an experiment. The distributions of where people lived were very different. Um, if you got an experimental voucher or a section eight, did it matter for outcomes to visualize this is in Chicago, um, the, the modal um, place where the control group and the, all these started out, um, one of the large public housing um, high-rise units. Many of them have been demolished since, um, but this was the sort of modal starting place. And you shouldn't think of people moving to rich suburban neighborhoods, think of them to working class, better off, you know, 30th to 40th percentile, but very different looking neighborhoods. So these are modal neighborhoods families moved to in Chicago. So what did we learn? Very different things for adults and children, which I think tell us very, something about the nature um, of neighborhood effects. So for adults, hi, Larry, I, hi, yeah, John. hi. I, I'm sorry. Um, a quick question, but th th this is this is perfect so far. But uh, just to interject, can you give us your thoughts about why such a move could actually improve educational, health, or labor yep. market outcomes? So you have people going from one spot to another. And if you could give us some, some structural insights about what they're leaving, what they're getting, and whether we could move what they're getting to the place where they start. Yes. Maybe you give us some so, insights about that. Yeah. All right. So I've, you know, I've been given a short shrift, but you know, if I had my full set of slides, there would be the sort of mechanisms and theories. Yeah. So the, you know, uh, the, they're sort of, I would say two broad you know, types, those where it's the neighbors themselves that matter and operate through a form of peer effects or sort of contextual effects. So having more advantaged neighbors um, could matter through the types of peer interactions. If you have kids who study more, you may study more um, if you move to your neighborhood, which could operate through the neighborhood or through the school, um, less involved in crime or you may be less involved in crime. So there are contagions, sort of peer effect um, sort of mechanisms. There are adult role model mechanisms that sociologists like William Julius Wilson very much argue were important, sort of having stably employed people in your neighborhood versus others. And then there are a set of neighborhood environment issues that are clearly important. If you're less harassed by the police, that may be a very different sort of environment. If you have greater second chances. If you do the same sort of youthful indiscretion in one area and they throw you out of school and suspend you or they you know, arrest you as opposed to giving you a warning, it may have very different um, long run consequences. Um, the schools themselves, it turns out schools per se don't change as much as neighborhoods in this experiment because many of these cities already had school choice for public schools. So you should think about an MTO, this isn't a general, schools sort of being in the 15th percentile on average for the control group and the treatment group moving to like the 20th percentile school. So it improved, but not, whereas for neighborhood, sort of the average income of your neighbors, that went from like the fifth percentile to the 40th percentile. So the nature of school districts and school choice meant it was a much bigger intervention for other dimensions of neighborhoods than the schools. We know from lots of other independent work, you know, chart your work and others, charter school lotteries that schools per se matter, but there are other aspects of the neighborhoods we think are most important um, in the MTO. And then there are other prosaic 
things that matter, you know, less pollution, uh, less heat, we actually know from maps and areas. So health and human development of kids, they're in less polluted environments, safer, less stress, and for the adults, we're going to see the stress stuff of being in a dangerous, you know, more polluted area matter a ton. And for kids, these long run development. But uh, what, what I'm going to argue is the, the other fact, the other hypotheses, the big ones and what that were viewed were things known as the spatial mismatch hypothesis or social networks for adults. So the argument is exactly where you lived in a metropolitan area would matter for your labor market outcomes because you'd make different connections and have different referral patterns, or the commute time would mean you end up with very different. And so what I'm going to show is the evidence from TO, as well as the growing observational quasi-experimental evidence, is hugely strong for what I would call the childhood exposure developmental model of neighborhoods. The longer time you spend in a safer, um, more advantaged neighborhood versus a more dangerous, less advantaged neighborhood in childhood, um, the better your long run um, outcomes. Um, for adults, there are very important impacts of your neighborhood environment, as we see right here, on your health, your well being, and your stress, um, violence. You know, in MTO, the number one reason families wanted to move was concerns about crime and violence and stress and having to look after their kids, not about jobs, not about um, actually schools. That's, you know, um, so for adults, as we will see, there were very large impacts, immediate and 15 to 20 years out on health. Um, in the later work, we you know, use biomarkers to detect diabetes and stress measures. So substantial impacts, but nothing uh, really on economic outcomes. So this is you know, about as big a null effect as you can find using administrative data on employment over the next 12 years for the adults. It really didn't change. So what's interesting is we, we know because there are no impacts on income or employment, we know any effects we see on kids are not just an income effect because there is no sort of real income effect. The value of the housing you know, voucher is the same as the public housing and sort of how much income and there were no employment effects. So this is a very big contradiction of sort of the spatial mismatch um, sort of local networks at least um, of the type of low income households moving to higher neighborhoods doesn't seem to change. And this is very much, think about what's going on now in COVID-19, um, where we see there have been huge um, declines in demand um, for work of people living in poorer neighborhoods from people in richer neighborhoods. Um, some of the recent work by Opportunity Insights where we're staying at home um, and not employing a lot of people in restaurants and service or you know, in care, that has, you know, it doesn't really matter which zip code you live in. If you're in a low wage job, it's pretty much an integrated labor market and it's your skills and your broader connections that matter. So demand declines in well off neighborhoods are impacting people, you know, not, you know, living in poor neighborhoods throughout the metropolitan area. So changing where you live within a metro area as an adult doesn't seem to have a lot of impact. It's tough to build the sort of networks that you do as a child or um, to really change. That doesn't mean you can't affect adult outcomes. A stronger labor market raises everyone in that labor market in a boom versus a recession. Moving across labor markets, so moving you know, from a declining to a you know, uh, cross-country moves, we know from lotteries you know, to get immigration H-1B visas or to move from you know, Tonga to New Zealand have huge impacts on your outcomes. So if you change your labor market and the productivity of the area, but within a area, the sort of spatial mismatch seems very unimportant for adults economic well-being, but your current environment hugely affects your health and well-being. So the same null for economic outcomes for adults are very large impacts on measures of psychological distress, even 15 years out on measures of happiness. Um, as I noted, C-reactive protein and blood tests go down 15 years out, um, improvements in diabetes, um, and huge reductions in extreme obesity, which is a huge long-run problem in this population for the adults, but it doesn't translate into economic outcomes. So um, those, high, those mechanisms don't seem to be what's going on. Whereas for children, what's very interesting is the early results showed very little going on in test scores um, and achievement. 
uh, you know, some gender differences with some improvements for girls and reduced risky behavior and physical health, mental health, a little evidence that boys may be more involved. And the one interesting thing we did is we did voice recordings um, in our long run evaluation. And we do find that um, for African American, for black uh, youth, for parents, no change in the way they um, talked or spoke. For uh, the kids growing up, especially the younger kids, you do see a, a mediating factor of greater usage of standard American English versus African American vernacular English. That's not saying there's anything good or bad of exactly how you speak, but it's an example of something that doesn't show up on test scores suggesting um, a different sort of social capital code shifting and ability to live in sort of different types of neighborhoods that we show up. So uh, when we had completed what was called the final evaluation of MTO, and this is sort of our group indices um, about 2010, um, we were very much um, denounced um, by many people in other social science fields for this wasn't a true enough experiment, the change in neighborhoods wasn't big enough because the kids weren't thriving, the adult economic outcomes didn't change, and economists were sort of ignoring it. Of course we know where you live shouldn't matter. Um, but um, we then pushed on, and you know, one of the great ironies of the cost of doing research over a very long period is the, let me push back, the creation of this simple graph of using administrative data um, to track um, the employment outcomes of the adults um, back in, you know, prior to 2010, when you couldn't get access to IRS census data, there was no national director of new hires. We had five different site states, people moving to 28 different states. So we had to get permission from every single different state they moved to UI office to get their UI data individually. So I had teams of research assistants working for years, just getting permission to collect the administrative data. We had to go out and do surveys. It was $20 million an evaluation to do the interim and long run um, MTO surveys in the field, tracking these people actively, 11,000 kids, 5,000 families, putting together the administrative data. The long run evaluation um, where we had access to administrative IRS um, data um, with Raj Chetty um, and Nathan Hendren um, in 2015 and then 16 published was a $100,000 research project where the only cost, not counting our time, um, was uh, basically some pre-docs um, working in the IRS office in Boston and their time um, because we were passively tracking. So the cost of research and doing administrative data collection now in the US with the availability of IRS and census data um, and restricted access environments um, has changed dramatically the ability um, to track people. So we were very concerned that it was premature um, that people were drawing the kids didn't have any effect on their economic outcomes because in the interim survey we were looking at people who were still teenagers or in their early 20s and we knew from lots of longitudinal data that that's a very poor indicator of long-run economic outcomes. So once they were in their mid-20s we were able um, with the work that Raj and Nathan had done to link up, got permission to link the MTO um, kids and adults um, to IRS data to track them wherever they went and look at um, adult outcomes and building off the non-experimental work of movers across, you know, 5 million movers across US and the IRS data, we had a particular hypothesis we wanted to look at that younger kids should benefit more and older kids less because the younger kids have more exposure of these developmental effects. So we split the data in half at the median age they moved and you know had a pre-specified subgroup of younger kids versus older kids and we you know the adults we found the same outcomes as before no impact well we already had the administrative data but it was really the kids. And what we found was something um, striking that looks like the combination of childhood exposure with some disruption effects of moves without having a long enough time. The younger kids, um, basically the tote is sort of a 40% increase for the experimental growth, 30 to 40% increase in household income, 30% individual income, um, and somewhere halfway in between with the halfway moves for the section eight group. 
Um, the older kids, if anything, a negative effect, the disruption effects outweighed um, the sort of developmental if you moved at 17, um, whereas if you moved at 10, and we now you know, have some work for college going, take the kids who moved at five or seven or four, and it looks even bigger. Um, so what we have concluded is from the experimental evidence, a lot of consistency and we then did a lot of multiple hypothesis testing showed that the breaking the groups by age versus all the other breaks of subgroups in MTO that this really looked like an outlier and it fit with the observational is that there clearly seem to be neighborhood influences of, over, of the amount of exposure you get um, to where you grew up to a more advantage versus less advantage environment. It's not just driven by test scores. That's not saying there aren't important school quality, but even without that, it seems a lot fixing on this sort of assimilation, changing your sort of network and other sort of non-cognitive, what are called non-cognitive skills, but are very cognitive, and the possibility of second chances, the same offenses, not um, leading you to be um, dropped off you know, much more in suburban, well-off neighborhoods, kids who have problems are not given up on in the way that they're more triaged in less resource neighborhoods. Um, and what's striking is that we now have, you know, building off the work that Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren did in Movers, um, shown in this left graph here using the huge census IRS data showing these childhood exposure effects, the amount of time you spend in a better neighborhood, the age you move as a kid is sort of almost linearly related to your long run outcomes and about 60% of the differences in that initial map of observational outcomes across areas seem to be what you get when you move and spend your, you know, uh, from age three on in one of those neighborhoods. Um, and very similar work now we're seeing um, a paper recently in the AEJ um, by Deutscher doing the same thing in Australia. Uh, Lila Berte's work forthcoming in AEJ showing similar results in Montreal and Canada, uh, administrative data in Denmark, and we see the MTO data very much lines up. Um, in fact, if we take the opportunity atlas measures of upward mobility and take the five sites in MPO and three treatment groups and line up, you know, again, 15 data points, but you do very well in predicting um, the within site differences in long run outcomes of kids earnings using the observational differences um, across areas and predicted upward mobility from the, you know, actual whole a universe of kids growing up in those neighborhoods. So there's growing evidence that childhood exposure effects, very similar stuff in Eric Chin's work recently in the AER using the um, timing of public housing demolishments in Chicago. Um, for young kids, um, very large increases in earnings. Older kids with less exposure, very small um, changes in earnings. So our substantive conclusions from the MTO work and uh, related quasi-experimental work that we've comparing is that there's a lot of evidence for these childhood exposure models called developmental by sociologists like Rob Sampson, um, William just, you know, um, and that the observational variation and upward mobility across areas seems to have a large causal component. Um, in our best estimates using MTO and mover strategies, maybe 60 uh, percent um, of the variation could be neighborhood place effects of child exposure, not just um, sorting. And for adults within an MSA or a commuting zone, neighborhoods matter a ton, but what, what moving to opportunity should be called moving to tranquility. So you're healthier, you know, think about COVID-19 being in an area where fewer people have to commute to work in dangerous conditions will lead less of a spread of epidemic. We see this in real life. So health, um, stress, and well-being, but your economic outcomes, you know, is more the need for training and further education or changes in discrimination, which operate throughout an MSA, not exactly where you live. There are big place effects for adults, but those are moving across labor markets and across countries and across regions. And a new review that Eric Chin and I are doing has been looking at the wide range of studies. So for, but for children within an area, your outcomes within an MSA communities are hugely affected um, by where you grow up is what we would say. So 
that's sort of, you know, the big picture um, sort of questions. And then I want to, you know, I can stop here and answer questions or talk a little bit about where we've been moving to try to think about the policy implications and ways to build on this. So. Yeah, I think a few questions sharing, Larry, would be awesome. Um, that, that was fantastic so far. Um, the question that comes to mind is, is, is based on that, that gradient of, of, of age to the benefit of moving. What do you think are the policy prescriptions that come directly out of that? Um, are they something that the policymakers should actively try to, to use? Um, or is it something that once information gets out there, people will then be making better decisions? Yeah, so this is exactly what the next experiment I'm going to talk to you tries to address, which is the Creating and Moves to Opportunity project that we've been working on in Seattle and King County and now spreading nationally. And the basic idea, which Rob said, children's prospects for upward mobility vary substantially across neighborhoods, as we saw. Most, a large part of that seems to be causal. Moving to better neighborhoods seems to greatly improve children's outcomes in adulthood, our policies to help low-income families mo move mobile um, are housing voucher programs, the Section 8, but the vast majority of families who get those end up staying in higher poverty, you know, more segregated areas. Um, differences, you know, obviously differences in rent is one reason, but what we've seen is there seem to be, this is where families who get vouchers historically actually live in Seattle and King County. Um, so, they're not moving to the blue higher opportunity areas. They're living in the lower opportunity areas, even though they have mobile vouchers. Um, and this is the rents across higher or lower opportunities. So it given there are lots of what we call opportunity bargains, areas that have you know, affordable rents on a housing voucher that you could move to. So the big question we ask is, is this information you know, or preferences for other aspects of racial segregation, being comfortable, or are these barriers where landlords won't even pay attention to you if you want your own a Section 8 or just the fear of not being treated? And that is what the Creating Moves to Opportunity experiment we've been working on is how much of this is sort of, what if you just gave information? What if you really have a comprehensive program of interventions to try to help families where we try to work with landlords, tell them um, that, you know, vouch for them, get people to get sort of a note written by their local pastor about how they've had good behavior and that you're not going to be a risk, work, you know, overcoming some of the bureaucracy of public housing authorities. And so what this is exactly what we've been trying to test, which is what are the sort of, is this really, you know, an equilibrium where people are making well thought out choices in the information, or if you actually, you know, we, we spend $40 billion in low income support. And as we can see this map, very little changes the amount of segregation. Could we actually help more families move to these areas? And what we're finding in, is that a comprehensive package of helping deal with landlords, information, quick financial incentives to deal with things like security deposits and um, initial moving costs can have huge impacts. So this is historically only about 12% of families in Seattle and King County with a housing voucher moved to what we call higher opportunity areas. With our intervention, we're getting over 50% um, to sort of move and you know, if I really want to push, this is short run, but they're persisting, you know, one to two years out now, and they're much more satisfied with their neighborhood, so they don't ex post think they're making a mistake, and they think they're going to stick around, so they seem to be anticipating um, sticking around in these neighborhoods. This has just been one or two years, and in our sort of qualitative work, which has been a very important component adding to it where we've looked at sort of 161, we find basically that they tell us that, you know, really dealing with landlords in the short run, it's the financial money to do today, you know, if you have to go to the public housing authority and a week later, they'll give you money from some fund for a, you know, security deposit, you've lost that housing unit in Seattle. If tomorrow your counselor can get you the check and you can bring it in. So the, the disadvantages that low income families have of searching, even if they want to move to different neighborhoods are tremendous. And the other thing we found 
as we've broken up in stage two into the individual components is information by itself gets you almost nothing. It's not that people don't know where higher opportunity areas are, where areas with better schools, um, you know, the financial, the small amount of financial information gets very little. The full support of having an individual counselor dealing with your own problems. And again, this intervention is about a $2,600 per family intervention, so it's not nothing. But the average housing voucher that, that this family is getting is sort of like, you know, $1,500 a month over the entire you know, childhood. So we're talking about a couple percent of the cost of the program, which right now most public housing authorities in the US are banned from doing because they can only use the money um, basically for the housing vouchers. So we're talking about small one-time support as in moving to opportunity counselors. So we think what we've been learning is that there is there are large barriers to families who aren't sort of connected moving to higher opportunity areas and that modest amounts of upfront support can greatly change the types of areas you live in. And so um, in fact, the findings from this research led to an act passed and one of the rare bipartisan acts passed in the recent Congress in the US in 2018 to set up um, some money uh, to develop creating a move to opportunity programs and demonstration projects. There was actually a recent request for proposals by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is actually going on to do about 10 more creating moves to opportunity tests outside our Seattle using random assignment field experiments and money to expand the number of vouchers for families with kids. And for example, in the current campaign, um, we see these issues, which you might have thought of peripheral hugely um, showing up again with Donald Trump um, attacking um, you know, the, all the terrible things that are gonna happen in suburbs. The one thing that this research so far hasn't been able to show are the spillover effects in the other areas if you create housing mobility programs like this and the Biden campaign actually wanting to create universal housing voucher programs and mobility. So this has moved centerpiece, um, certainly with the current controversies you know, over policing and race and suburban into sort of the policy area. Yeah, just, just that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, that was, just good. that was good. That was great. Just pushing that a little bit. Um, what do you think is like the the equilibrium allocation of households within each neighborhood? Do they want like just perfect mixed neighborhoods? Yeah. Um, what's the final objective? What's the final equilibrium that you're hoping to go towards? So. This is, you know, a very, you know, there's sort of two different questions, the individual um, sort of preferences, and then, you know, integrating that into the market equilibrium and the, you know, sorting. So what we have seen is that in our, you know, in our baseline surveys and creating moves to opportunity, we asked them what sort of neighborhoods they would prefer to move to. About 60 to 70 percent, 75, depending how you measure it, um, indicated they were quite interested in moving to one of the different neighborhood areas in Seattle, King County, um, that we were in our high opportunities sort of areas. Um, yet in the control group, we see very little, you know, very few families are able to do that. It's much easier to just lease up, you know, very nearby. They only have a limited time period. There's a lot of fear of not being able to lease up and then losing your voucher if you tried to go to these sorts of areas. So, you know, uh, and among the people in the receiving areas, there is a growing interest, you know, not everywhere of having more diverse neighborhoods, more people, you know, want to be in, you know, there's certainly a subgroup, you know, obviously if everyone wants to be the majority, you can't have an equilibrium as Thomas Schelling says, but there seems to be people are willing to sacrifice that, you know, lower and modest income families to be in areas they think are safer and higher income families are quite tolerant of having more diversity and their kids having more exposure. So it seems like there's a possibility, you know, think of work like Gautam Rao and in India and the benefits of high income kids of having a more diverse group of kids in their schools, in their neighborhoods, but the equilibrium, and this goes back to the amazing work of Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy in sort of social economics, a wonderful book they wrote about 20 years ago about how you can get it's very difficult if the hiring of families have better purchasing power, and even if they only slightly benefit from the better schools or better amenities, they're going to outbid 
the low income families who may benefit more, you know, as Jim Heckman has said, you, you know, you don't you know, get to choose your parents and stuff. And so we think that strategies, you know, like CMTO that spread out people in small amount across both are what the lower income families are choosing and don't seem to create the problems of building, you know, of sort of white flight uh, type things of building huge, you know, projects um, in the, you know, uh, higher income sort of areas. So, you know, the question is the amount of growth of segregation, would having the degree of segregation in the U.S. had 40 years ago really be a terrible thing? Um, since, you know, we're, we, you know, the amount of increase has sort of been sort of huge. We've lived in worlds with less economic segregate, you know, segregation than today. Um, there are you know, the spillover effects of where you move are not the field experiments really, you know, what you'd need is a two-stage field experiment where we made some areas, some parts of the city eligible to receive families and other parts not eligible and then saw what happened. We can't look at the receiving areas because almost by definition, the type of receiving area you can move to in a housing voucher is slightly declining. So you can't compare it to, because that's why there's a vacancy and you can move in there. So a lot of observational work saying like places that people with Section 8 vouchers move to have bad things happen is really not, you know, credible because that's the nature, you know, you move to the area that's getting slightly worse. That's why a landlord was willing to rent to you, even though it's a much better neighborhood than you would have moved to otherwise. So we'd need a design like that, or we, we'd need to compare areas that have these sort of programs to areas that don't. So that, you know, so people, you know, like Jesse Gregory and others have built simulation models trying to look at housing choice. People have used MTO to sort of estimate more structurally uh, people like Ala Prontas and Sebastian Galliani, the underlying choice, you know, and tried to do sort of counterfactuals with that. You can do that for the poor families. You can't really do that for the receiving areas. So that's where work of people like Rebecca Diamond, Jesse Gregory, and others of trying to build more structural models of choice of neighborhoods and how they do Patrick Bayer um, have been very important. But, you know, that's more speculative, but I think very valuable work, and it can be informed with the experimental variation. Well, thanks, Larry. Yeah, that's really good. Larry, a few thought experiments that maybe you can help me try to put some bands on these results. So let's say that I have a three-year-old and we live in a high poverty area and a bunch of low poverty families move in and replace all of my neighbors. So it's just an exchange versus I move my three-year-old to an existing low poverty area from my high poverty area what are the counterfactuals in each of those cases where I just change my neighbors versus I change my neighbors and all of the structural um, surrounding features of the neighborhood? Do you, do you have enough um, variation in your data to lend some insights into each of those counterfactuals? Yeah, well, there have been, you know, here is where you, know, you can do observational stuff. So a lot of people have been working with the opportunity Atlas sort of, you know, I think, you know, for MTO, you can't because they're just, you know, they sort of go together, you know, so what, what people have done with the sort of data from the Opportunity Atlas is do observational stuff of what are the correlates of high upward mobility for low income family across areas Are the attributes of the neighbors, are they the schools, are they measures of environmental aspects, and, you know, there's certainly growing evidence that, you know, you know, you're not going to get an equilibrium where all the rich families move into the highly polluted area because they're not going to move there, that there are direct effects of things like pollution and temperature and kids, you know, and so, you know, you'd, it wouldn't be as good if your neighborhood still had all those other aspects. Exactly, you know, whether the schools are endogenous to the lobbying of, you know, having richer neighbors stuff is something we can't really, you know, sort of work out except for other policies. So, you know, what I you know, what, what you can say is, are there, you know, what we're currently working on is do place-based policies that try to change existing neighborhoods have the same payoff as these mobility policies? So does something like empowerment zones um, where you um, try to give money for community development, do things like local community development organizations 
the change. When those neighborhoods change, we see improvements, but a big answer is because they have big change in who lives there. If we demolish yeah. a public housing thing and then a bunch of middle class families move in the units, we'd like to know what happens to the original residents, how many say that's been, you know, repeated cross section analyses of areas like Pat Klein's very important work with Jesse Gregory and Matt on empowerment zones is great but we don't know for sure. So the availability of the sort of link census IRS data, some work that Raj Chetty, Nathan Hendren, Rebecca Diamond, uh, Laura Tack and I are doing is trying to look at historical place-based policies, both from nonprofits and the federal government and what it does to the original residents in the neighborhood or does it change the neighborhood by just resorting people who would have done well otherwise. So that's still an open area and data has been a huge issue and this is something that could be done much better in many other countries than the US, uh, you know, Scandinavian countries, many European countries where you can longitudinally follow people in areas. So I think this would be a m much easier to, you know, looking things at like enterprise zones that have been run and other players. I think that's the sort of frontier right now. Okay, thanks. Rob, do you wanna ask a few questions? So let me ask a question from Sally Sadoff, Larry. She asks, what do you think are the mechanisms for reduced obesity in adults? I, I think the driving forces really are the stress mechanism. So in the, you know, we did ask questions about diet and exercise. And if you really squinted, you know, in the short run and in the interim, you know, you definitely got answers, you know, saying they were doing more physical exercise in the treatment group and they were more regularly, I mean, we did not have the ability to do it. Yeah, more regular eating, you know, fruits and vegetables. And I think the social norms changing those things, but the really big mediator that sort of seems to predict this are all the things that go with reduced stress, violence, and other parts and sort of stress induced, you know, sort of eating and diet. And there's other work, for example, you know, work on food deserts by Rebecca Diamond and others that say just creating access, um, not changing the stress in your environment, but putting in a supermarket with better quality food doesn't seem to do much for obesity or eating patterns. I think it's much more driven by you know, our hypothesis is it's really the changes in stress in adults' lives that lead them to have healthier habits. It's not access to sort of food because when you just change the access to food, you don't seem to get these same patterns. Okay, yeah. very good. Rob, do you want to ask Ioana's question or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go for Ioana. So Ioana, a uh, two question, Ioana Johnson. Um, how do you st distinguish between your interruption explanation from the competing explanations like children who move when they're younger are more likely to benefit from those better schools and those yeah. new friendships. And then secondly, what are your thoughts on the implications for inequality by moving families out of bad neighborhoods as opposed to improving neighborhoods? Is there much work on the latter? Yeah, so in the first, within MTO, we definitely can't tell. They're almost perfectly multi you know, so whether it's younger kids, in the, you know, and this is a very big if, if, if you're, you know, you have much more uh, precision to look at things when you use the 5 million observational moves of all kids in the U.S., you know, born in the 1980s, you know, looked up, you know, 30 years later in the sense IRS. And so what you can do is you can look at what's the return, you know, um, of moving across areas, you know, at 13 and spending, you know, sort of five years on average versus eight versus four. And, you know, what we seem to find, you know, if we go back to that exposure thing is that, you know, years in a better neighborhood seem to even matter when you're sort of 13 um, or 15 or 17, and they look, don't look that different than years from sort of three to seven, you know, with very big caveats of different sort of selection um, sort of things. And, you know, if anything moves at very young ages, you know, it doesn't really matter where you are at age two or one, it matters a lot where you are from sort of three to 20, it seems to be. So that is not, you know, so the quasi experimental data of looking at different ages within family of kids moving um, seems to a number of years, you know, it's not perfect, you know, but there's a little bit of evidence that, you know, you don't have, you know, if the mechanisms or social interactions in your neighborhood, that's not much affected at super young ages. If it was all just pollution, you know, there's other stuff that shows up, but, you know, you know, inequality um, implications. So, 
uh, you know, my view is that things that reduce the degree of segregation, you know, in the, we know how to change, you know, mobility and where people live, you know, through housing mobility policies. And, you know, our, my view is that that has good implications, you know, um, for inequality by reducing, you know, creating more um, economically integrated neighborhoods would create more tolerant higher income kids and create better opportunities for lower income kids. Um, and that it would make landlords and neighbor, poor neighborhoods more competitive as higher income families actually bid for them. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, one view is reducing, you know, in some sense, I think of the housing market version of the wonderful work on labor markets of reducing discriminatory barriers um, that people like Chang She, Chad Jones, Eric Hurst um, have recently done, um, showing the importance to growth of reducing, you know, labor market discriminatory bar barriers. I think similar things of neighborhood reducing segregation, allocating people where they benefit less. The how that compares to place-based policies, you know, I think you know we want to work on both margins. We just have less evidence on the effectiveness and whether place-based policies get offset by some of this resorting. But you know, this is what our current moves is. But yes, I, you know, we have a lot of evidence that improving schools clearly, you know, improves the kids' outcomes and reducing sort of pollution and others. But I think you know a true policy response, you know, is clearly we want to make sure every child does not have a dangerous, you know, sort of environment. And we think we would all benefit from, you know, being less segregated in the way we are now. But, you know, as I said, the general equilibrium questions are much harder to answer with a field experiment. Yeah. Uh, has there been any work done um, on, on the MTO where you get all like the preferences of, of all the families that want to move? And then you randomly assign them to get like their first best neighborhood versus their fifth best neighborhood. And there's a clear difference in quality between them. And you randomize whether you get one or five and they all go. And you then see, you can like drown out the interruption effect, but you can see the differences in quality yeah. of the neighborhood. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, some sense, the attempt at having the section eight versus the the MTO experimental was, you know, giving some groups real help and others just moving, you know, gave the interim, but, you know, we haven't, you know, there are lots of different things we want, you know, ideally we wanted to make half the neighborhoods available and then look at spillover effects, but, you know, given the budget you had at the time and power and precision issues, there are lots of other designs that I'd love to see other people do. There are all sorts of human subjects and others. You know, the, one of the nice things about the creating moved opportunity is that we're not being paternalistic and forcing you to move. We're giving you help in moving to different neighborhoods and we're affecting, you know, changing it because there are barriers, but we're not forcing you to use a voucher. There are, you know, currently out of some discrimination court settlements in the U.S. in places like Baltimore, very fine housing mobility programs in which it is a condition to participate, you have to move to a high opportunity, low poverty area and that, you know, it's, so you can have paternalism, but we have, you know, I think those would be great experiments and trying to find natural experiments that generate that would be great. We haven't been able to, you know, design or do that. That, uh, you know, would be a difficult one to pull off. Got it. Thanks, Larry. So, Larry, one last question. I, I can't, and this is just a, a tidbit that you have in the data. The, the families who don't move, who are part of the voucher program but decide not to move, do those adults and children have different outcomes from the control? I can't remember. Um, you know, again, that's a, obviously you can't really compare because we don't know who in the control group would be the types of people who don't. If you look at the- No, no, no I realize on, that. I'm just on, looking at the control versus the people who don't move. What does that look like? You know, they, the people who don't move, you know, uh, do worse than the people who move in the data, but, you know, whether that's like, you know, you know No, I understand law. it's all selection. I mean, it's yeah. all, but, but I think it tells you something about the motivations as well that that is important yeah. uh right because right, but it, that, yeah you know if that you the half at, who moved have more motivation to move the half who didn't yeah. have less motivation so we did do and there have been a number of studies of what predicts who moves when they get a regular voucher yeah. an mto yeah. voucher 
Not surprisingly, the best predictor is the question in the baseline survey, how confident are you that you'll be able to move with the <laughs> voucher? The other interesting thing the great first stage is, thing. <laughs> is that there was a strong negative selection of move that people who felt particularly that boys in their family were having trouble were much more motivated to move and were much more likely to move. So a lot of this was motivated by trying to help their kids. So people who report, yeah, parents yeah. who reported their kids were having more problems were actually more likely to move yeah. and take up than kids who they thought were sort of doing better. But there's also a lot of vagaries, you know, people's families, you know, you win the lottery, it's a few months before your family status changed, you have a new boyfriend, you split up with something, new jobs, there are a lot of sort of vagaries there. But the, there was, when we were, you know, there was a group in sociology that took just the people who moved and persisted to very low poverty areas and looked at the adults and then compared them to the full control group to wanted to argue there were huge positive effects of MTO on the labor market outcomes of adults, which we had to write a reply to the American Journal of Sociology about Absolutely. why you're sort of giving up all the experimental variation when you do that. So we have been very hesitant to want to do things like that. No, no, that's why I asked that question is because when you look at the people who sort in, you wonder if the people who don't sort in end up being a symmetric uh, twin to those, to, to the, the sociology um, study. And, and I think that's been sort of interesting about, about selection or sorting, but, but that kind of leads to the next question about if you have treatment and control, you, you looked at pre-trends probably. And, and those were all okay in the in the experiment. People who were in treatment and control, uh, all yeah. the important pre-trends look similar. I mean, for the things we can do pre-trends, which is the administrative employment data, there's nothing. That, uh, that's good. Good. good, very good. But okay. you know, this, think, you know, uh, we like, should let you go. You yeah. have, things like their wonderful. health and their well-being. We have, we have no ways of no, yeah, yeah, exactly. But you'd expect those to be. We're, balanced. we're, we're living off random assignment in five thousand, and hopefully in the law of large. Yeah. No, that that's reasonable. A absolutely. No. Yeah. no, Larry, super stuff. Thanks so much for joining the conference, um, both yesterday and today. Today was wonderful. Um, and I'm sure I speak for Rob that we really appreciate you spending time with us. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much, Larry. Much appreciated. And um, everyone, we have a next panel in 10 minutes. So feel free to log off and then log back on and we'll be starting the panel in about 10 minutes. So thank you, everyone.